Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to share something with you that I'm pretty excited about. So one of the big joys for me is actually making videos, obviously, for you guys, but I think one of the things I really love doing is these live action videos. I really love having the mask on and being able to be on my set in front of my camera. Sometimes I want to post something that's a bit shorter, you know, that fits those live action intros, but I don't want it to be able to be something that's kind of just swept under the rug or something that disappears. So I was pretty excited when I found out about Amino's new story feature. And the fact that the stories don't just disappear like in other places. You guys have probably seen stories on other apps. However, they're always gone in a couple of hours, 24 hours, however many times they're around there. But on this one, you can actually have a wall of stories and they don't just disappear. They're ones that can actually be around for a long time. Amino reached out to me and I kind of decided to join in the fun. I'm going to be posting a couple of different convention updates uh, and a few different live action things. You guys should be able to see a couple of those from me in the next coming days. If you click the link in the description or the pinned YouTube comment that should be at the top here, or of course you get to search for Amino apps and download Amino. My first story can be found by searching Mr. Creepypasta, so I'll show you how to do it right here. And make sure to follow and click the bell to know when I'm posting a new video, just like YouTube. And every time you watch my videos, you'll be supporting me. So if you like my videos, this is kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> this is a free way of keeping up uh, with me and to keep me creating. All right, guys. On to tonight's story. My name is Lily Madwhip, and I have no idea where I am. This is the teacher's lounge, Lily. That's Nurse Whitmore. At least I think it is. It sounds like her. She's been the school nurse for two years. Before her, we had Nurse Faye, who never believed anyone was sick. She'd just take our temperature and then tell us we were fine and send us back to class. One girl, Janie, went to see her because she felt nauseated. Nurse Faye sent her to class and she ended up turning into a human fountain in the middle of social studies. It was gross. I sit up and look around. I've never been in the teacher's lounge before. Students aren't usually allowed in here. I heard that if a student goes into the teacher's lounge, they come back missing a finger. I've never known anyone who did it. Obviously, everybody I know has all their fingers. There's a big coffee pot with cups over by a sink and a bunch of tables with chairs. Nobody else is in the room with me and Mrs. Whitmore. What happened? I ask. Nurse Whitmore smiles at me in that way that says, I feel bad for you, but I'm happy thinking about it. You fainted in the middle of the school assembly, dear. That's right. The lady in black was apparently our guest speaker. And then the black fog was all over my feet and somebody started coughing. Oh no, the angel of death was the guest speaker? I feel like I can still see all the smoke surrounding her, leaking into the floor from the other side of the door out into the hallway. How, how many are dead? I dread the answer, but I need to know. Nurse Whitmore seems taken aback by the question. I beg your pardon? She asks. How many are dead? Nobody's dead, Lily. You just had a fainting spell. It can happen. There wasn't a gas leak or anything. B but I heard coughing. I remember just before everything seemed to go black, like the smoke was covering my eyes completely, and, and there was someone coughing in the crowd. Nurse Whitmore touches her cheek, kind of in the same way my mom touches her chin, like they're pressing enter on some search engine in their brains. Coughing. That was probably Drew Sanders. He's got asthma, sweetie, that's all. He's in my office right now. That's why we had to bring you to the teacher's lounge. I don't know, Drew Sanders. I, I hope he doesn't die because of all this. Is he going to be okay? Oh, he'll be fine. He just needed his nebulizer. That sounded like a space-age technology. What happened to the lady in black? Nurse Whitmore looked puzzled. Who? The police lady who is at the assembly. Oh, you mean Officer Flores. I'm afraid I don't know. She probably left after the assembly. Police are busy people, after all. Nurse Whitmore stands up and brushes off her clothes. I guess adults get dusty a lot because they always seem to brush themselves off when they stand up. I wonder what the assembly was about anyway. Having fainted, I missed out on what Officer Flowers actually came to say. 
I bet it was about the dangers of people with angels of death hanging around pet stores. Or maybe it was to tell us that smoking is bad for your health. Can I go back to my class? She shakes her head. Your father is on his way. I don't need my dad right now. I need Pasher, and he's outside in my backpack. At least, I, I hope he still is. I left him in the pack by the swings before Meredith set Lisa Welch's stupid red backpack on fire, and I didn't get a chance to bring them inside with me. What time is it anyway? Almost 11? In a half hour, it's going to be lunch, and then after that, recess. I really just need to get my backpack and Pasher back. I need to go get my backpack. I left it outside by the swings. I guess being honest is the best policy. Nurse Whitmore accepts this explanation. Okay, but come right back with it. Sorry, Nurse Whitmore, but I can't. I've got to get Pasher and then find Meredith and tell her about Felix. I gave her a warning earlier about weasels, but I really don't think she's going to understand what I meant at all. I walk down the hall to the front, going past Mr. Longbow's office with all his eagle paintings. He's sitting at his desk, talking to someone else, and doesn't even notice me. I'm glad, because I'm sure he'd probably come out and stop me if he did. Outside, my backpack is still sitting by the swings. Thank goodness. This is my favorite backpack. Really, it's my only backpack, but of all the backpacks I've had over the years, this one is my favorite. It's been knocked over probably by Jamal or Greg as they left for their own school. But Pasher's still inside and he tells me that he's glad I'm okay. You shouldn't leave me behind, Pasher says, now more than ever. I know, I'm sorry. I know he forgives me because he's an angel and they're all about forgiveness. Well, forgiveness and punishment, I guess. And secrets. And fires. Pasher, I need to know where Meredith lives. You mustn't go to Meredith's house, he tells me. That creepy man I met at the hospital is after her, I reminded him. We talked about all this just the other night. Pasher, you know she's in danger. If you go to Meredith's house, things will be much worse. Will... Will I die? I can't answer that. What? What do you mean you can't answer that? You know everything, and you can see the future even better than I can. You know what the plan is, Pasher. Why can't you tell me if I die? There are too many outside elements at work here. The inclusion of Nathaniel and Dumma and Raziel are setting things out of alignment. I'm getting frustrated. Not because I think Pasher's keeping secrets from me, but because I, I have no idea what he's saying. What does all that mean? The other angels are messing with the future? Pasher says, pretty much. <sighs> I, I'm scared. I don't want to die. I was reading a really good book and I haven't finished it. Also, I kind of want a dog at some point. Preferably a big one that doesn't die easily, in case I run into Officer Flowers again. What's up with her anyway? Why was she visiting my school? Was she looking for me? Maybe she was looking for Meredith. Maybe Officer Flowers is working with Felix and they're hunting for Meredith together. I need to find Meredith. Where does Meredith live, I insist. I can see my dad's car pulling up in front of the school. I wonder if he sees me over here by the swings, talking to Pasher. I need to find out where Meredith lives before my dad notices me because I'm not supposed to be talking to Pasher. I have to do it in my head or privately because they'll take him away again if I start acting like he speaks to me, even though he does. Pasher gives in and tells me her address, but insists that I not go there. I say it to myself several times. If you say something a bunch, it's easier to remember, especially if you didn't write it down anywhere. I guess I could write it down. But I see Nurse Whitmore come out of the school and start talking to my dad in the car. She sees me over here by the swings and waves for me to come over while my dad fills out some sign-in sheet for me. I walk over to the car. Nurse Whitmore is leaning in the window talking to my dad about my fainting and how I should be okay to come back to school tomorrow, but it might be best to take me to see a doctor. 
Dad is just nodding quietly, not looking at me. I can't even really see his face to tell me if he's angry or worried. Nurse Whitmore takes my backpack with Pasher and passes it through the window to my dad as I climb in the back. Lily, wait, Pasher says. I'm not listening, though, because I'm trying to buckle up, but my vision is beginning to act wonky. I think I'm starting to see something before it happens again. I try to focus so I can tell what it is. It's... it's... looking through the front windshield of the car as we drive down a road I'm not familiar with. Well, that's useful. All right, Lily, says Nurse Whitmore. You be well. We'll see you bright and early tomorrow. Thank you, I hear my dad say. He... he sounds weird, like he's come down with a head cold. In my vision, we pull up alongside a small green house. I'm looking at the mailbox, and it has the number 86 on it. It's the same number as Meredith's address. We must be going to her house! That must mean I convinced my dad to go there so I can warn Meredith. Oh, good. I know Pasher doesn't want me to go, but maybe my dad can help. We pull out of the school parking lot, and something, something smells funny. The car... The car smells unfamiliar. Like like when you take it to get cleaned and get it back and it smells like someone else. Dad? I start to say. But it's not my dad's eyes looking back at me in the rearview mirror. They're too small. Too... Beady. Like a, a weasel's eyes. I'm afraid I'm not, Lily, says Felix. I get goosebumps all over my arms and legs. Why is Felix weasel face in my dad's car? Where's my dad? I yell. I unbuckle myself, but Felix shakes the steering wheel and the whole car weaves back and forth. It's real dangerous to be unbuckled when someone's driving reckless like that, so I buckle back in. I don't know what I was going to do anyway. Jump out of the car? I think I've seen enough roadside deaths recently. I don't want to be one. What did you do to my dad? I scream at Felix. Is he dead? Felix looks back and grins. No, 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 don't look back. That's how people get T-boned by giant trucks. Keep looking forward, you crazy weasel man. I wave at him to keep his eyes on the road, but I don't think he understands the universal signal for face forward, dummy. Your father's fine for now. You know, I thought about just coming for Meredith at school, but you're a smart girl, aren't you? Somewhat, I think. I know enough to stay buckled in and to look where I'm going and that if Felix finds Meredith, he's going to kill her because he's angry about what happened to his son, Joey. I'm not top of my class smart, but I'm one of those kids who knows you spell it ketchup or catsup and it's the same word. I figured the best bet was to wait for you to get home and just have you take me to her. After all, I knew where you lived, but not her. And I knew you didn't know where she lived at first, but given time you'd find out. I think Felix likes to listen to himself speak. It's all part of knowing people, Lily. I know how to learn the things I need to know and how to use people to get the things I want. Like your dad. Thanks to what I gleaned from you at the hospital, I was able to talk my way into your house easily. Where's my dad? I say as calmly as I can. Felix's lips curl up in his creepy weasel grin again. I'll tell you when this is all over. It really depends on if you give me any trouble or not. Pasher's gone quiet in the front seat. I think I know why. I think it's the same reason Raziel, the angel in Felix's locket, won't speak. Anything they tell me, Felix will know. Just like how he must already know Meredith's address thanks to Pasher telling it to me. They will not speak to me with Felix near, because I'm like, like a radio antenna that Felix can pick up their signals from. A, a really fleshy antenna. With hair and a face that's really pissed off and glare-staring at him from the back seat. Mr. Felix, Meredith didn't kill Joey. 
Felix's mouth twitches, and he looks back at me with a bit of anger in the rearview mirror. It's almost impressive how much beadier his eyes get when he's angry. They're super beady. Like, how can he even see anything with eyes that small? She set fire to the stage we were on, Lily. Well, she couldn't have done that without being angry, and only because she was near you. Yes, I know. He looks back to the road. But just because she didn't mean to do it, doesn't mean she's not dangerous. Didn't she nearly kill another girl just this morning? No. I don't know if it's fair to call Lisa Welch a girl. I want to call her other things, like swear jar things. I want to go to the bank and get one of those big rolls of quarters and pop it open and pour it into the swear jar and then talk about Lisa Welch until all the vegetables in the house turn brown from the rotten, rotten words I use. You're a terrible liar, Lily. We turn onto Rosemont Drive. That's the street Pasher told me is where Meredith lives. We're going to be there in a matter of minutes. I can't convince Felix not to hurt her, and I don't think I can stop him once we're there. I've got to do something drastic. Dad, I'm really, really sorry. Mr. Felix, I say, looking him dead in his beady weasel eyes. He looks back at me. Yes? You're going to crash. I can see the glimmer of understanding cross his face, but it's too late. I dig my hands into the grips of my car seat and tuck my head down between my knees. At the same time, the steering wheel spins out of Felix's hands as if guided by invisible hands. Angel hands, maybe. Do angels even have hands? Maybe they have... Hundreds of hands. Maybe angels are like centipedes. <laughs> Ew. The car veers off the side of the road going somewhere around 45 miles per hour. If my dad were driving, he'd probably be going even faster. He doesn't care about speed limits. I'm surprised he hasn't already killed everyone in the family. I, I wonder if he's alive. I hope so. Up over the curb and through a large hedge we go, where we smash into a tree in the middle of someone's yard. I was in a car accident three months ago. It took my brother Roger's life. I know the terrible feeling of having the vehicle you're sitting in come to a sudden stop. All your body parts want to go one way while your seat and belt and everything between them wants to stay put and stop with the rest of the car. It's like the world's worst roller coaster. One nobody pays to get on, but people find themselves riding when they least expect it. For a moment, everything goes black. I wake up, and I'm still buckled into my car seat. Felix is laying across the front, groaning and covered in glass from the windshield. The airbag deployed out of the steering wheel. That didn't happen when we got T-boned. I've never seen an airbag deployed up close before. It looks soft. Too bad Felix went sideways. I bet he'd have felt real comfy resting on the airbag. Well, my dad's going to be pissed. This is the second car in three months that got wrecked. I can see from the back seat that the front of the car is all crumpled up like it's trying to hug the tree. I hope we didn't hurt the tree too much. Sorry, tree. Someone's at my door banging on the window. Are you alright? It's a lady in jogging clothes. It occurs to me that I should be grateful we didn't actually hit her. I should have been more careful about what I said to Felix. Speaking of Felix, he's making pain sounds and pulling himself up. There's glass all over his back and I can see that he's got scratches down the sides of his face. His nose looks bent funny. He doesn't look like he's entirely aware of what just happened. Get me out! I scream to the lady outside. I try to unbuckle myself, but the seat shifted and I can't find where it's buckled in. Help! This isn't my dad! My shouting is just confusing her. I don't think she can fully hear what I'm saying, but she's trying to get the door open. It just seems to be jammed. She pulls out her flip phone and is calling 911. Oh, thank God, yes. Yes, call the police. Get me out of here. One of the front doors creaks like someone's trying to crush a soda can. I look over and Felix is no longer in the front seat. The lady on her phone is telling whoever's on the other end about a car crash into a tree on Rosemont. I can hear her describing me as a frantic little girl. 
lady, I'm only frantic because there's a crazy guy loose and I don't know if he's armed or willing to kill me and you. Do you really want to die right after jogging? No one wants to die all sweaty and exhausted like that. I don't have time for this. I think Felix is going to Meredith's. I can't sit here and wait. I've got to do something. Pasher tells me to stay put. Don't go to Meredith's, he says. I can't listen to you this time, Pasher. Even if it means I die saving Meredith. I need to try. I slide down out of my seatbelt and wiggle to the floor of the car, then climb over into the front seat where I pull Pasher out of my backpack. Oh, my lunch got completely smashed. And it's about lunchtime, too. That sucks. Now if I die, I'm going to die hungry. Hungry, and my chest hurts. I think the seatbelt bruised it. Pasher won't stop telling me not to go. Stay put. Wait for the police. Trust me on this, Lily. You have to trust me. I trust you, Pasher, but I need to do this. The lady in the jogging clothes sees me climb out of the front seat, and she runs around to see if I'm okay. Lady, there's glass all over me, and I'm climbing out of a car that's wrapped around a tree. Does that seem okay to you? She finally notices that Felix isn't in the driver's seat anymore. Where did your father go? He might be injured. That wasn't my dad, I tell her. I'm okay, please. Just tell the police to head to 86 Rosemont. The bad man who kidnapped me is going there. You should sit down. She puts her hands on me and tries to guide me away from the car instead of doing what I told her to. I shrug her off and run through the giant hole we made in someone's hedge. Other people are coming out of homes or pulling over in their cars to see what happened. My dad's poor car is hissing. It sounds like a big metal snake. Maybe uh, one of the tires is losing air. I can't tell what exactly the noise is. I don't even really care. I'm trying to drown out the sound of pasture in my head and pay attention to the numbers of the houses. I can hear the lady in the jogging clothes behind me yelling for me to come back. Over it all, I hear sirens. I hope they get here in time. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you for listening to tonight's video. And quite potentially tomorrow night's or last night's video, depending on how many times I've reused this recording. I especially want to give a big thanks to Eric Mary, John, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Frederick LaRue, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Tyler Ramberg, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Siegwert, Szempinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Andrea Solvik, and Andrew Steinberg. You guys and everybody who is supporting on Patreon are the real MVPs. And if anyone would like to join them, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Or if you'd just like to support the show without, you know, Patreon, then honestly, every view or minute or however you watch or listen to this creepypasta story time on the YouTube live stream or here on YouTube, the podcast on Amazon, Google Play, and on Spotify. And if you'd like to support my wife, then there's nothing better than listening to scary stories with some Dungeons & Dragons themed herbal teas. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. Alright kids, thanks so much for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>